Take a look at any ranking of countries based on how happy or satisfied their citizens are, and it routinely puts all five of the Nordic countries in the top 10. According to the 2018 World Happiness Report, Finland, followed by Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, take the top spots this year. What do they know that the rest of us don't? Well, let's find out from three people who just took part in Harborfront Center's inaugural Norden Festival. And they are Michael Booth, journalist and author of The Almost Nearly Perfect People, The Truth About the Nordic Miracle. Robert Zola Christensen, Danish novelist and academic who teaches at Lund University in Sweden. And Naya Bianco, Greenland-born, Toronto-residing founder of Isuma Consulting, which specializes in Nordic and Arctic affairs. And we are delighted to welcome all of you three very happy people to our studio here tonight. Thank you. And let, let's actually put some numbers on what we talked about in the introduction here, because if we go to the happiness index, Mr. Director, if you would, there's Finland number one, Norway number two, Denmark number three, Iceland number four, Sweden comes in at number nine, which still cracks the top ten, and there's little Canada. We're, we're in the top ten as well. We're number seven, so that's not too bad. Let's find out, is, is happy, Robert, the right word to apply to the satisfaction that Scandinavians feel? I sure do, yeah. I mean, I live in Sweden and I'm born in Denmark and I've been almost all over the places in uh, Nordic countries and I sure do feel that we are happy. And I think it's due to that we have uh, found a balance between, uh, between work and leisure time where we kind of um, are able to uh, enjoy both, both our works and also our leisure time at the same time. That's why I think. Hmm. Well, apparently even Oprah thinks you guys are fabulous because, and Michael, in your book, um, you refer to a papal-like visit that Oprah Winfrey took to Copenhagen in 2009. We're gonna play a clip of that visit and oh, yeah. we'll come back and chat. Go ahead, Mr. Director, if you would. I just love my first visit to Copenhagen, Denmark. Researchers have named the Danes the happiest people on earth, and it's not difficult to see why. All the bike riding, eating fresh produce, free education, free health care, and a year of maternity leave, paid. It was eye-opening and refreshing to see how they live without a lot of stuff. I think most Americans would be amazed at some of what I saw at Nene and Kim's home. So I hear people have generally smaller spaces, but everything is as everybody as neat as you. We don't have a lot of stuff because when you're like a family of five now, yeah. if we all have a lot of stuff, we, we couldn't be here. The space less thing is more life, Yeah, I guess. Boy, boy, that sounds like an ad. <laughs> less things, less space, less things, more life. Yeah, the grammar nerds here are going to say it's fewer things, not less things. But anyway, is there something to this notion of less is more? Uh, well, I, I have a problem with the word happy to start with. Uh, these people are not happy. They're not throwing their sombreros in, in the air and heel kicking down the street. They're, they're just satisfied. They're content with life. <laughs> And part of it, that is, yeah, they've discovered a, a, a different form of capitalism from the one in North America and the Anglo world. Um, it's a, 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 a less consumerist, less uh, rapaciously individualistic society. And that's one of the many factors that, that helps make them feel satisfied with their life. It's not everything, but it's one of the things. So yeah. there is less keeping up with the Joneses, then, if I can put it that way. Well, there is and there isn't. I, I'm lately become fascinated by this Freudian concept of the narcissism of small differences. Have you ever heard of that sure. before? Yeah. I love this idea, and I think the Danes are specialists at this. So they, they differentiate based on what they have, but just on a very, very more subtle level. <laughs> it's like um, bat radar can kind of pick it up. So when lovely Oprah comes to Denmark, and a bit like the Queen everywhere smells of fresh paint wherever she goes, you know, wherever <laughs> Oprah goes, she's going to have a great experience. But the reality is she didn't see all the differences and the complexities, of course. Now, one of the things we also now hear about Scandinavians is that they pay among the highest tax rates yeah. in the world. And yes, we heard about the health care and we heard about the education and we heard about how there is a level of satisfaction or happiness, use whichever word you prefer. But there are those high tax rates. Why do those seem not to be um, deal breakers for Scandinavians? Well, I think coming back to what's been mentioned already, that it's um, we're dealing with capitalist societies. And even though some people, people might think that we're dealing with socialist utopias, this is not the case at, at all. It's not socialist it's utopia. It's not socialist utopias. It's definitely market economies. 
But I would say these are market economies with a heart. Mm. Mm. And these are market economies and welfare states that provide for their inhabitants uh, in terms of education, as you mentioned, mm. in terms of uh, health benefits that are very, um, that, that keeps people happy, basically. But we have seen in North America, I mean, 40 years ago in California with Proposition 13, 20 years ago in this province with the election of a conservative government that came to office pledging to cut taxes, and it happens frequently. There are these tax revolts, you know, the Tea Party in the United States more recently. Do you have anything like that in Scandinavian countries? Um, now, the, the, the Scandinavian country that I'm most familiar with is, is Denmark and Greenland, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a Tea Party movement, no. There are, um, there are forces within the parliament that would like to pay more taxes, but if you look more at... More or less? Or less, sorry. Less, okay. less taxes. Um, but if you look at the, the parliament in general, they're all very happy to pay taxes because we, we feel that it's an investment that we get value out of. Okay, that's um, something I yeah, haven't heard I before. People are happy to pay taxes? It's, yeah, I think so, actually. It's uh, in a social cultural perspective as well. You're getting used to it. You adapt it. You re reproduce a system that you find. When you travel around the world and you bump into people and you tell them that, well, in Denmark, it's like an average 36% of your monthly paycheck that you pay to taxes, they kind of, they're blown away saying, no, impossible, I think, no, but that's how it works. And somehow you, well, you're, you're born in Denmark, you get used to it, not only in Denmark, in skinny US in general. So you kind of, you, had, you get used to it. It's the way that we live when it comes to, for instance, if you want to buy a car, I mean, it costs twice as much in, in Denmark as in Germany, for instance. To buy a car. To buy a car, for instance. I mean, it's kind of a, well, I must admit that when you fill in your form once a year and you realize how much you actually pay, you get a shock. Nah, no. But then again, after, when you, as the, the beneficial part, as um, Nadia mentioned that, you know, the hospitals, infrastructure, and all your everyday life, you, yeah. You're all the way in fight with that. But you live in Sweden, everyone drives Mercedes in Sweden. It's, still, it's a little <laughs> exactly. bit different. It's very, but yeah. Actually, there was a survey <laughs> just last week that said uh, uh, contentedness with the tax rates in Denmark among the people is going up. Mm. People are happy to pay these taxes because the majority uh, feel they get more than they give, and that's true. You know, mm. over 60% of people in Denmark get more than they contribute to the, uh, to the coffers, uh, whether they're working in the, in the public sector or they have children in school or they experience free universal health care, free university, or good transport. They feel they're getting their money's worth. Mm. Does that sound odd to your British mind, that people are happy Very to pay taxes? Odd. It was so traumatic, Steve, to, <laughs> to go to a country and see more than 50%. It's not 35%. For, you know, for, the, for the most people, it's more than 50% of their income ends up with the state. They have, there is yeah, a the last that, crown, so to speak. Yeah, yeah uh, not, you know, mm. they have the highest energy taxes yeah. in the world. Mm. Uh, the car tax is 180%, 25% VAT on mm. everything, on including everything, food yeah. and maybe not books, but no the books tax, taxes are astronomical on everything. Mm. But people just, they're paid a lot, that helps. Mm. They don't work very much, that also helps. Mm. <laughs> so they feel they're getting the work-life balance pretty, pretty, pretty much uh, yeah. spot on. Is there something, Naya, to this notion of uh, Scandinavian exceptionalism? Well, I wouldn't term it as Scandinavian or Nordic exceptionalism. Would I would rather it? term it as the Nordic model. Mm -hmm. um, also, people of, uh, of the Nordic countries are somewhat humble, and they don't really like to talk about ex exceptionalism as such. Uh, but there's definitely something connected to what we term as the Nordic model, which is indeed the welfare state and mm -hmm. what it provides for its inhabitants, but also what it derives from. So coming back to why people more or less happily pay, the, pay their taxes, mm. I think has a lot to do with the trust. There's a lot of mutual trust in, in the Nordic countries. Mutual trust mutual, between citizen and government or among all? Between citizen and government, for example. Yeah. And that's why we trust uh, the government to utilize the taxpayers' money in a way that benefits all. Hmm. There, and I mean, one of the traits that all of the Nordic countries seem to have is that there seems to be a high degree of equality among the citizens. And we've got it. thank you very much, we've got a graph that shows this. This is, they call it the Gini coefficient. And the idea is to get as close to zero as possible. Zero being pure equality. And there's Iceland at number one, Finland number five, Denmark number six, Norway at number eight, Sweden at number 10, so they're all cracking the top 10. Mm. And Canada, you know, we like to think of ourselves as a pretty egalitarian society, but we're only 20th best based on the world inequality database.
Michael, can you give us a few snapshots of what equality feels like on the ground in yeah. Denmark? Well, first of all, we should knock Iceland off. Iceland's not a real country. There's only like a couple of hundred people who live there. So <laughs> that think is, of Canada as the 19th position. There, is, there are as many people in Iceland as, well, what is it, 300,000? 330,000 yeah. people. Okay, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's a good-sized city. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, being ridiculous, of course. Uh, <laughs> Iceland is a very valid nation. <laughs> Um, equality, for me, it's about equality of opportunity more than anything else. Mm. That's the crucial fund foundation for the success of these countries, is that, generally speaking, every child that's born in Scandinavia gets pretty much the same level of education for free. There are very few elite private schools anywhere, and especially in Finland, they're the world champions of this. Mm. They have the best, one of the best education systems in the world. If you exclude the kind of hothouse uh, countries like Singapore or South mm. Korea, where children are actually happy and enjoy going to school in Finland, uh, they, they have one of the best education systems in the world. It means whatever school you put your child in, wherever they are in the country, they'll get pretty much the same level, mm -hmm. high level of, of education. And that's where it all starts for me. And then there's the quality of healthcare, healthcare provision as well, of course. These two things, I think, are really, really crucial. So, yeah, the income levels, mm, you know, there are different income levels in Denmark, believe me, and you see it, uh, particularly in the provincial areas. But in terms of that equality of opportunity, that's the foundation. For healthcare, can you, I mean, one of the things that, that allegedly does not happen in Canada is you cannot buy your way up the queue. Right. Can you yeah, do yeah, that? Yeah, there's private healthcare and it's growing mm -hmm. in Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, from what I understand, it's not better. You can just maybe get an, a knee operation a few weeks earlier, but mm -hmm. the quality is not better. You're a Dane yeah. working in Sweden. Yes. Are Danes more notably egalitarian than Swedes? That's hard to say. I mean, uh, normally when you, when you approach uh, Scandinavia, as we do here today, look at all the flags. Nice kinda, flags, eh? Yeah. Yeah, nice flags. And you have a feeling that, that uh, you see it as a unit, as a homogeneous area, but I don't think it is at all. I mean, mm. I've been a lot around in uh, the Nordic countries, and I feel just like two close neighbors like Sweden and Denmark, there are huge differences between the two countries. You might say it's too close for comfort or anything, something like that, but I, and we have a lot in common too. But I think it's, it, we are, it's so different. I mean, I've been moving back and forth for like my entire life, nearly. Hmm. And I think that the, the difference is mainly that um, how we see it back home, when I say back home, then I mean Denmark, of course. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of, uh, compared to Sweden, we feel that they're a bit stiff in Sweden, like it's all by the book, uh, stick, stick to the protocol. And by Denmark, we are much more frank, in a sense. So I feel that all, every time I go back and forth, I feel to have to change a little bit. Also, with the way that you use the language, even. Hmm. So you might say that um, it's a result. When we're talking, talking about the, the, the Nordic model, I think that on top you find Sweden, actually. It has kind of, it's a bit come nearly in the sense that this togetherness, consensusness, has become nearly too much in my point of view. Hmm. It becomes a bit dull even sometimes. A, a bit, bit dull. Yeah. Well, let me confirm that. When I see Swedish hockey players interviewed during intermission at hockey games on television, they are the worst interviews. There's no doubt. They say the <laughs> least. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they try to be dull. This is a whole new perspective on Scandinavian. I feel about then that again, to, oh. Yeah, but to follow up on that one, it's also like you feel that all that what we're talking about is also that you are supposed to, being a, a part of the community, you're mm -hmm. supposed to not to stick out too much. Mm -hmm. You're not to keep your head down. You're not supposed to, to brag too much. Mm -hmm. you, you, we don't, uh, we don't uh, embrace ambitions, for instance. You never talk about how much you earn, for instance. Mm -hmm. and. Don't be greedy, that's the worst thing mm. it can be. Sure. So it, when, when you travel around and you bump into other people with other values, you always feel that, wow, in, to America, for instance, they are so loud compared to, to, to Scandinavians, for sure. Because we, are, we, we have your rage to be a bit uh, humble and mm -hmm. to be an excuse for ourselves, more or less, compared to other countries. And that's a downside to it. And I truly believe that is the case, too that you're supposed to stay in the flock, stay in the herd, and don't stick out. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a downside to it. We, we call it in Canada the tall poppy tall syndrome. Tall poppy syndrome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, feel, I, feel, I, but yeah. I do yeah. feel so. So yeah. now we are talking about paradise in Scandinavia. I have to add that uh, that side of it, I love sometimes to, to go away somewhere else and hmm. then let loose a bit. Well, let me ask you about Sweden. Do you think because it's bigger than the other countries that it, it is less egalitarian as a result? Uh, not necessarily, um, but I would I do agree with Robert that uh, Sweden is um, sort of the aristocracy of yeah. the Nordic countries. They are extremely political correct. Um, 
and um, always try and always try to find a consensus. They don't mm. like to disagree, uh, not within politics and not between people that are even very good friends and yeah. have and go a uh, uh, long way back. Mm. Um, so there's this. Um, extreme sense of having to be in consensus all the time. Mm. So they're literally going through their worst hell right now in Sweden because yes, right. they have no government, yeah. because they can't agree on who's going to be in the government. You... And this is like an existential nightmare for Swedes. Mm. Do you want to just explain that a bit? They've got a hung oh. parliament, right? Because they've got... No, they haven't even reached that situation yet because they haven't been able to find uh, an agreement between parties right. as to who's going to be the prime minister and who's going to be the ruling mm. bloc because the, the margins are so tight mm. and the balance of power theoretically would be held by the extreme or the right-wing um, mm. Sweden Democrat Party. And no one wants to get no in a better No one wants to have anything yeah. to do with they them. And they never yeah. have done. They've mm -hmm. always been outcasts mm. in Sweden. But they may have to change the way this time? <sighs> they I don't they think won 17% yeah. of the, the, the vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. 17, yeah exactly. That. And it seems to me that's a pro problem, that now what happened in Sweden was that they kind of they were excluded totally. They were not in uh, any ne negotiation at all. And it's kind of when that many people actually voted for them, you kind of feel that, how come that can't be, uh, they have no say at all. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit weird in a sense. Did you love Borgen? We all watched Borgen here, didn't we? Borgen was fantastic. Borgen, remember yeah. that? That's just, just for those who didn't know, we showed it on TVO over the course of a few years. Yeah. And, uh, it's about the Danish parliamentary system and the... Mm. And it was great for the Danes' self-image yeah. to yeah. see the outside Indeed. world. And they, they yeah. suddenly realised, oh, actually, it's pretty cool, the system yeah. we've got going <laughs> here. Uh, the gender equality, having a female prime minister was exactly. no biggie. Yeah. Um, and I think the Danes began, began to realise they have something mm. very special. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I do agree. Um, so I love Borgen, mm. even though I did feel, because I was working for government at that time, that it was fairly close to my reality. Yeah, yeah right. Um, but... Um, I'm not a big fan Mike, of the bridge, though. Michael yeah. brought up the, the notion of gender equality. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so I, I agree with Michael as well that one can always discuss the term of happiness. Maybe we can use other terms that are more adequate. Mm. But uh, when you look at the Nordic countries, I think definitely gender equality plays a huge role. Yeah. In except terms except of... for one oddity about that, the violence against women mm -hmm. in Scandinavia, they top the world rankings. How, how do you explain uh, that? Because it's always a strange one mm. for me. Yeah. That's true. And, you know, Surely there's strange. always a snake in every paradise yeah. um, and, uh, and paradoxes in every paradise right. as well. So. Sweden, <laughs> Finland, Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, from memory, they're in the top mm -hmm. five yeah. in terms of violence towards women. Now, that may be a lot to do with the reporting of it is much more efficient and people, women feel that they can report violence against them. Mm -hmm. But these countries shouldn't even be in the top 20. And mm -hmm. I don't understand right. the strange dichotomy. Hmm. Is it accurate to describe all of these countries as we often hear American politicians particularly on the right, say they're all socialists. They're socialist countries, and we don't want to have anything to do with that kind of no. socialism in the United it's States. totally wrong in the sense that I Not find it very interesting. Now, we might say we have found a path between what we might call the, the, the former superpowers. Uh, earlier on, we had it was pretty much divided in the East and West. Mm. And the West was like uh, pretty much based on the market, supply and demand uh, state, for instance. And then on the other hand, you you had the East, uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, rigid communism. But I think we have found a path somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And what we are taking the best from both in the sense that the system kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, the, the government take care of uh, basic uh, necessities. And, and on the other hand, we have the, um, a free mind, I think, that also uh, well-educated people, there's no pressure from above that they had in the former Soviet Union. So we kind of voluntarily step into that kind of system it's not a, a result of being suppressed or just a free market. I mean, that kind of, it's very, that's, my, that's the way I see it, actually. When, when I asked if, if uh, these countries were socialist, you were quick off the mark to say, absolutely no, wrong. No, How they're come? not. Well, for example, I grew up in Thatcher's Britain, mm. where privatization went rampant. Mm. But Thatcher, in her wildest dream, would never have privatized the ambulance service, for example, which they have in Denmark. They have a private ambulance service. Hmm. So in many ways, Denmark went much further in that regard. Also, the ease of starting up a business, yeah. much, much better, according to in these indexes. Mm. We're, we're swamped yeah. in indexes, but Denmark is the best country in the world for starting up a new business. Yeah. It has corporate taxes that are down near American levels. So it has this strange mix of... Uh, they're, well, they're the real land of opportunities, mm. these Scandinavian mm. countries, yeah. in terms of making it, making money, starting a business, mm. but also in terms of self-actualization yeah. in, in becoming the best you, in becoming yeah. 
getting a good education and so on. People say if you want to reach the American dream, you should do it in Denmark. <laughs> you should go to yeah, Denmark. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Because it's easier to actually happen there. Because it's, yeah, it happens huh. in Denmark. And um, in rankings that relates to starting uh, businesses up, hmm. um, Denmark ease of is doing business. the ease and, of doing business. Yeah. All of the rankings related to that, yeah. Denmark is, uh, and the Nordic countries are lie well, very high. Sweden, not so good. Actually. That's right, yeah. These things, I mean, Bureaucracy. often I feel like telling people, such as yourself, Steve, don't take offence, but there's no such thing as Scandinavia. There's no such <laughs> thing as the Nordic, because the Nordic model is different in every country. Hmm. The, the economic models are, are widely different. Norway is awash with oil money, so that's yeah. a completely different mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Finland has been uh, dallying with bankruptcy for yeah. years because it put all its eggs in Nokia, mm. and that basket has gone. Um, Denmark has this flex security system where it's much easier to sack people. Mm. Sweden, it's mm. impossible to sack anyone, yeah. but they have this strong... <laughs> you know, it's True. very, very diverse and different. Yeah, Iceland is... with the banks? Say again? Iceland, Iceland with the yeah, banks. I mean, oh, they're, yeah. they're out on their own. Mm. They, they went feral for a while. They're doing better now, actually. Yeah, but yeah, then yeah, they they're recovered. They're they bounced back. They mm. brought some women in to run the show. Sorry, I'm like I'm negative on Iceland. No, no, no. You're OK. You're OK. Let's, uh, speaking of being your best self, should we hear from Oprah again? Because that's, oh, you know, she's all about that, right? OK. Mr. Director, go ahead. So the twins are outside sleeping. Yes. And who's watching them? Nobody. See, that would be unheard of in the United States. Yeah. You, know, you can't do that. But we do that in the streets as well. Mm -hmm. But you do it in the streets like your babies? You leave your babies, yes. like, outside cafes and yeah. things? Nobody wants to steal your babies. <laughs> Nobody wants to steal your no. babies? No. So you feel really safe. Wow, what about, like, child molesters and things like that? You don't have that here? We don't think about it. I mean, of course there might be some, but I've never heard any cases of a baby carriage getting stolen or anything here in Copenhagen or in Denmark. It's like she's never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well I, I, that I know people who wouldn't leave their dogs outside <laughs> a, a grocery store, you mm -hmm. know, for 10 minutes to go in and get something, and these folks leave their yeah. kids outside. Can you help us understand this level of trust among citizens in a society? Well, uh, there's this great concept called the lollipop index. Have you ever heard about this? It's, no. It's, it measures the safety of a, of a country in terms of how far you can let an unescorted child go to buy a lollipop on their own. Oh. And the Scandinavian countries are the best at this. They, they have the best child freedom. I think Denmark, I don't know so much about uh, mm -hmm. raising children in Sweden. Mm -hmm. It's the best country in the world to have kids and raise kids because they have tremendous freedom. Mm -hmm. Uh, tremendous, there's respect in society, they're protected. Mm. Um, we haven't got all, uh, like Oprah, obsessed by uh, paedophiles hiding in every bush mm. like they are in the UK or America. So uh, it's a fantastic country to raise kids. Hmm. What do you think explains this remarkable trust people oh, seem to have in each other? I don't know. Other? I mean, it's... Uh, I've heard that part two. Uh, there was a case, wasn't there, about ten years ago or mm. so, there was uh, a couple that were accused, that they were convicted even, that led there in a, a cafe. A Danish lady? A Danish lady. So in, in New York. York. In New, New York, York was, yeah. That's right. And it, was for all Danish, it was on, on the news. You know, it made the news uh, many places, in the States as well, and in, the, in Denmark. And it was like, back home, we're sitting there, OK, what happened? And she was just sitting in there behind the window, so I heard. So it was a big, uh, big thing. But I, I, I mean, there might be some differences between Denmark and Sweden. Now that I live in Sweden, they are so pampered in Sweden. It's unbelievable. It's yeah. I mean, you have, if you if you look, if you find a kid on a bike in Sweden, they might have extra wheel set on and a grandma and you know a, a huge helmet and uh, <laughs> and their uh, west with lights on. And in Denmark, you kind of hey, uh, we are. It's all about security in Sweden compared to Denmark, that's for sure. How much of this, I, I think until recently, these were all fairly homogeneous countries. Yeah. Uh, maybe not the last year or so, but certainly for most of their history. How much of that factors into the notion that people trust each other more? I think it means a lot because uh, we recognize each other. And uh, we know that we're more or less doing the same things. Like we, we, we take a walk with our baby mm. in and we don't mind uh, leaving the baby outside the bakery if we're going for uh, a, um, a pastry or um, even a coffee, as long as we, we mm. have eyesight with, uh, with the baby all times. And I think the, the recognition part um, leaves responsibility to each other. Mm. So we trust each other in being responsible for for more than just our own child, or more than just our own house, or our own things. Yeah. Michael, do you think that only works because it's a mostly homogeneous society? It's such a political question now. It is. You know? it? It's a yeah. difficult one to answer. Yeah. Um, 
they have the highest levels of interpersonal trust in the world in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems that, from these studies, that immigrants have the same level of trust in the people around them, and people have the same level of trust mm -hmm. in immigrants. Hmm. Uh, so it, it seems to suggest that that's not so important, maybe. You know, I hope it's not, but it's a, it's a really, it's a tricky one. Though. Well, here's, now, now I have to bring you all down. You ready for this? Yeah. Not everything is peaches and cream in Scandinavia. Here's our next chart. Go ahead, uh, Sheldon, let's bring this up. The consumption of antidepressants daily, and this is in doses per 1,000, and look who comes in the top 15. There's Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway. Even Canada's up there pretty much, and we're a pretty happy country. But the amount of antidepressants consumed by people seems to be disproportionate to what we've been hearing so far. Can you explain this? Yeah. It's a total red herring. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's just they have good medical systems. They have good diagnosis. It's just, and there's no um, stigma attached to mental ill health. So it's, that it's, part it's not true, the... but also you, you might say that it's a matter of, I mean, if you are living in a society with happy people all around you and you don't feel, you feel, you feel uh, miserable and not unhappy, mm -hmm. then you, you might start uh, cracking, consuming and... and I'm uh, sure that's definitely uh, yeah? a factor, so yeah. It, also yeah. the suicide rate too is pretty high and you might mm -hmm. say, hey, I've heard that part too, that how come mm -hmm. you say that you're that happy and then you are suicidal. Yeah, but then again, if you live in a society where everyone around you seems to be pretty happy, then you feel even worse. Worse. Interesting. So that, yeah, but it, that goes also for antidepressant, uh, Prozac, and also mm. for the suicidal, uh, the suicide rate, I think. We're hearing, since you, you uh, are at a university, I should ask you this, we hear a lot now about young people feeling very anxious, yeah. mm. feeling, you know, um, just very nervous about the, their futures. Do you see that as well? Yeah, I do, as a teacher, when I huh. teach. Yeah, sure. It seems that they're very, very such a fragile, uh, the new generation that mm. I received at university, I can tell. Uh, mm. And I have an impression that it has been for the last 10 years or so, and I don't know why. It could be due to the fact that we kind of pamper them too much. That could be an example that mm. they suspect that we are there all the time. Uh, that we some become, as a teacher, for instance, become new parents. I don't know if that's the case, but... Uh, this is the curling parents. Do you have that concept mm. in Canada? The which? The, cur the curling, curling parents. We call them... You curl you, you, you everything in front of them. Uh, brush the path in front yeah. of their oh. children no, to make we, sure everything is nice. So, we call it helicopter parenting yes. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Helicopter parents. I think it's yeah. Yeah. kind of yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Case, yeah. But uh, truly, I, I recognize... Uh, I reckon that. It, it have, yeah. yeah. See, Totally. But I think it's got Struggle. something to do with a sense of belongingness as well. Yeah. So um, even though the welfare states of the Nordic countries provide a security net under everybody, uh, all inhabitants, um, I think we, may, we might have left too much to the state to provide for. Hmm. Okay. And there's a limit to what the state can provide for. So every person will at some point during his or her lifetime feel loneliness. And you can't rely on the state to fix that. Yes. So a sense of belongingness and a sense of having more interpersonal relations that can help you with those mm -hmm. uh, struggles that we all have in life. And in that regard, we might be able to do a little better in the yeah. Nordic countries. There's definitely room for improvement in that regard. I wonder, I wonder if that's the downside of the fact that, particularly in Sweden, the Swedish state does so much to help people be autonomous in their lives, whether it's wives from their husbands or children from their parents or the elderly from their children. It's all about being autonomous, and that maybe is a bit isolating as well. Yeah. Well, this has been a lovely conversation, and I'm, I guess we're happy to sing the praises of Scandinavian countries almost all the time, but never at the Olympics when it comes to hockey. Okay. I'm sorry. Then we still want to be number one. Is that okay with you guys? You're welcome. Okay, well, fine. You're welcome. Yeah, we'll take yeah. Yeah. You're okay with that? Fill your boots. <laughs> My boots are full on that one. Can we thank Robert Zola Christensen, the Danish writer and novelist who teaches at Lund University in Sweden, and Naya Bianco, consultant on Nordic and Arctic affairs, and Michael Booth. What a great title for a book, The Almost Nearly Perfect People. We recommend that for your further edification on this subject. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.